In the previous video in this series I showed this interface I'm working on for the Z80 computer project and in that video I showed the uh, computer formatting, writing and reading a disk in single density format and that formatting uh, I was using was for um, 128 bytes per sector, 16 sectors per track and 35 tracks per side. I've now modified um, the software, the hardware interface is identical but I've now written some slightly different um, software. It's, not, it's, it's very similar, it's just um, the configuration byte values for the interface are uh, slightly different. This really um, puts the um, interface into double density mode and it's also now configured to read and write both sides of the disk. So the formatting I'm using now is double density, 256 bytes per sector, 16 sectors uh, per track and 80 tracks per side both sides. So it's about 640k of storage on a single disk which is actually quite good. So um, I've also found I can now with this setup use disks that I previously thought were uh, beyond repair and couldn't be read uh, or written to and um, it's actually working out quite well. A lot of the disks uh, I can now use, I've got lots of disks lying around as you can probably imagine and I don't know, I can't rem remember where most came from, but I can now make use of quite a, a few of them. So we'll put a disk into the drive. The uh, software that's currently loaded into RAM allows us to format uh, the disk on both sides and read and write whichever sector we want. So we'll now format this. Uh, you'll see on the scope some data. I'll explain what that is as it's formatting. So it's formatting, it takes about a minute to format the disk. It is formatting both sides, you can see the side changing. And what we have on the scope, the green trace is the index pulse coming from the drive. So we get one of those for each revolution of the disk. The blue trace is the side select for the drive. So it's alternating between each sector. So when it's formatting, it um, formats the top, uh, the zero side on the disk and then it formats the second side and then it steps on to the next track and repeats. Um, the purple trace is the raw data coming from the drive and the yellow trace is the um, DRQ line coming from the floppy drive controller so it, we get a pulse on that line every time the drive wants a new byte. Um, so I'm not using DMA, I haven't um, developed DMA for this system yet, that's what I'm working on next. Um, so we're using programmed in-out and um, it's actually working very well. Um, so it's getting towards the end of the format and what we'll do is we'll try reading the information on the disk. Unlike the previous um, video, the formatting is laying down proper format data. So when we read that, incidentally, the NVRAM checks some fail. Um, this is version 4 of the board now, and it in, it's, uh, includes the self-test. And um, because we keep modifying the uh, NVRAM, we get this check some fail. I haven't bothered updating the check some, so this pops up now and again. But in normal operation, when we write to the non-volatile RAM, we update the check some. And I've had this sitting on a bench for a couple of weeks with uh, just the battery attached and nothing else. And it retains data quite nicely. So uh, onto the, the disk, we'll try reading the current sector. And that information you can see on the screen. I'll turn this light out and try and cut down the flicker a bit. So hopefully it's a bit clearer. So we'll try that again. Don't need um, shows the information for a few seconds. So that is the uh, raw format information character. Uh, but what we can do is actually write to the currently uh, selected sector. So we'll try doing that. And we'll read that back. You 
can see there is now text there. If we try changing the um, sector or track or side, then of course um, we'll be reading a, just a formatted track and we won't get the text. So we'll try doing that. So these addresses are just the addresses I'm using in RAM for this particular program. So the first one is the sector number. So um, we'll change that. It's currently set to 5. That's just the default value that the software is using. We'll change that to 8, for example. The next one is um, the track number. So we'll leave that at 8. And the next one is the, um, the side. We'll leave that at side to 0. And the next one is the drive number. And again, we'll leave that at 0. So we'll exit that. We'll try reading this particular sector and this should now not show us that text it should just show us the uh, format information but if we go back to the sector we were using which was five and try reading that again we should get our text back so as you can see that's working very well if we try now looking at the other side of the disk so we'll change the side that we've selected currently it's on zero we'll select side one and we'll try reading that and as you can see it's reading there's no text there because it's just uh, been formatted and it's all working extremely well now one thing i point out here is that uh, as I've said in the previous video, what you do with the drive is entirely up to you and most floppy drive control systems are fairly restrictive on what the computer side of the system sees. The floppy drive controller reads a lot more information than it returns and that can make things fairly confusing because you might have a single bit error on a track and that might make the floppy drive control system reject the entire track and it won't return anything and it'll look like your entire disk is destroyed. Uh, also in the previous video I mentioned the uh, media type all being the same and notice this one says single sided double density and somebody's cut a second uh, slot here uh, so the disk can be used either way up. Now this particular disk has media on both sides and I didn't do this, it's whoever uh, had this disk previously um, but the point here is that um, in theory you can flip this over and use it upside down you can't do that in this particular drive because although the, um, the right protect slot has been cut, the hole for the index pulse is in the wrong place. It should be over here where the sensor is. But if we flip it over, the disk will just spin continuously because the drive is looking for the index pulse and it can't see through the cardboard. If you want to do this, you have to very carefully punch a hole uh, diagonally opposite this so effectively when you flip it over you need the hole in the same place otherwise it won't read however we can still use both sides of it so if we try putting that in it's unformatted at the moment but we'll try and format it So I'll fast forward through this bit. Okay, so it's finished formatting and we'll try reading it. So we should just have the format information we do and we'll that's not surprising um, that is the side that we would normally use if we were using a single-sided drive um, but because we're using a double-sided uh, drive uh, we've got uh, two read write heads so we should be able to access the other side of the disk so we'll modify the side value that's in RAM it's currently on zero we'll change that to one and we'll try reading that side And just to prove that it is actually reading the other side, what we'll do is write um, our text to that sector. So we'll just basically fill the sector with some random text. If 
we try and reading that back. You can see we have the text, but if we now change to the top side again, the zero side, and we try reading that back, we just get the formatting information because we're now reading the other side of the disk. Now one of the things that a setup like this does, and it's uh, something that's already I found useful, although I'm still developing this, I found quite a few uses for this already. In the, um, I'm repairing several other machines uh, at the same time and I was having an issue with a, uh, a boot disk on one of them and I was trying to figure out what was on it. So what we can of course do with a setup like this is look at the raw data. So you notice when we read a sector, the scope will update itself when we try and do that, so if we try and read the sector, we get some data on the screen. You can see the yellow trace is showing the um, effectively the requests um, to for us to read the data from it. So every time there's a new data packet ready or a new byte ready, uh, it will ask us to read it, and that's what's on the yellow trace. If we zoom into that, okay and it's uh, MFM encoded and the encoding is quite easy for us to figure out. So we have, I'll just do another capture so we've got a bit more resolution on the purple trace which is what we're interested in here. Okay so if we zoom into that what we have is the purple trace is the raw data coming from the drive. It is inverted but um, it's MFM encoded and what we can do of course is quite easily decode that. So the MFM encoding is quite straightforward um, once you've stared at it for a, a, a few hours. So the encoding for MFM is quite straightforward. If the previous bits in the data stream was a zero then the next zero would be encoded as one zero. If the previous bit in the data stream was a one then the next zero would be encoded as a zero zero and the one is always encoded as zero one so it's quite easy for us to go through this and figure out what the data is so the other thing that we need to do that uh, more easily if we do another capture so we have the index pulses so that tells us when the uh, sector started so we know then where the first bit is and uh, what we then can look at is the uh, raw data and the DRQ line. The DRQ line, as I said, it will go high each time a new data byte is ready. So we can now effectively break this down into a data bytes. Now if the disk is corrupted and the floppy drive controller can't decode it, we can still do this as long as we look at the index pulses so we can look at the disk track and search through looking for the sync pulses or the sync sequence. One of the things that can be confusing with this is if you're using something like a floppy drive controller, not all the bytes you write to it during formatting are the values it writes to the disk. Because the, um, the encoding has a, a kind of a clock sequence built into the data stream, um, the way it uses that mechanism to create unique values for synchronization purposes so it synchronizes the data stream to the decoding um, is it uses bytes that have missing clocks so for example the IBM A1 uh, byte value uh, has a missing clock um, in its byte in its encoded byte and that means it's a unique value within the data stream and you can search through looking for those and uh, again they're quite easy to find and especially I'm in the process of writing some software to decode all this um, so I'll be taking the serial bit stream it's not really part of this project it's a different project I'm working on but it will take the bit stream and it will decode it into um, whatever is coming off the disk and the, th the point here is whenever the disk is spinning um, and the head is lowered 
we'll get data coming out of the drive. So to manually drive the floppy um, drive and get data from the disk, all we have to do is um, toggle the motor start line, toggle the head load line, and then we monitor the index pulses and the raw data stream. We can capture the raw data and uh, process it in some software and hopefully get the entire contents of a floppy disk um, down to the bit level even if it contains errors which is something that's quite difficult to do with most um, floppy drive tools and almost impossible with a computer system that's attached to a floppy disk drive because the um, floppy uh, drive interface uh, will rarely return any data if there's uh, uh, an issue with the data so if the checksum doesn't match for the header or if the checksum doesn't match for the payload it won't return anything so a system like this is quite useful it gives us a lot of control over what we're doing and so the next step in developing this particular machine is I'll be incorporating the interface into the board um, we've now got to the point where I need to start adding a bit more comprehensive buffering can't really make this board any bigger or add any more devices without um, changing the way the buffering is working especially on the data bus um, and then from that point on um, I can start looking at adding uh, DMA and then from there um, further developing the tools to get data off the floppy disks and at the same time start developing the uh, operating system step one in the operating system will just be to get this running with um, CPM but once we've got floppy disks um, attached uh, that should be fairly straightforward so making good progress and uh, we can now read the floppy disks in single density single sided or double sided um, dual density or double density dual sided disks and um, we can format them however we want including the number of um, sectors and tracks one point with the sectors, as said, I'm using 16 sectors per track. And the reason uh, and the way you figure out how many um, sectors you can fit onto a track is you count the total number of um, bytes that are available on each track. And that's quite easy. We know that the disk is rotating at 300 RPM, so 200 milliseconds per revolution that's 200 milliseconds between each of the index pulses and that's one complete track so um, we know the clock frequency is 250 kilohertz and we can therefore work out uh, how many um, bytes there are how many bits and then how many bytes there are on each track we can work out based on our formatting how many bytes are required for each uh, formatted and unformatted um, sector and also how many bytes are required in the pre-sector header for each track and when we add all those together it tells us how many bytes we need per sector and therefore we can divide the total number of bytes on the track by the um, bytes per sector after we've subtracted a little bit for the end we need to allow a little bit uh, on the end of each track to cater for different uh, disk speeds and also the uh, number of bytes that are at the beginning of each track um, but it's, it's quite an easy thing to work out and then you, it just gives you a number and that's uh, the maximum number of sectors you can use the other thing you can do if you want to is so you can be sneaky and you can um, have a mismatch between the um, header information and the actual sector information and some manufacturers did that and they effectively made the disks copy proof to a certain degree by um, incorporating some hidden data and it was hidden by virtue of um, not effectively being declared in the um, the header for each sector um, but that's something we may look at um, in a later video but uh, for now um, we'll just uh, focus on the development of the current hardware